Thanks for watching County Report This Week. I'm Susan Kennedy. During the first part of this year, County Executive Ike Leggett has held a series of budget forums throughout the county. His recommended budget is currently in the hands of the County Council, and now the executive has started holding town hall meetings to answer residents' questions and listen to their suggestions about the budget. The first town hall meeting was held in Kensington, and Lorna Virgili was there. Lorna? Susan, a town hall meeting in Kensington with county residents where Ike Leggett addresses questions from the budget to Costco. County Executive Ike Leggett addressed dozens of questions from county residents, but first, a snapshot of the county's financial shortfalls. We have closed in a five-year period now $2.5 billion, $2.5 billion in budgetary gaps. That's billion with a B. It's a lot of money. Few jurisdictions anywhere in this country have faced that kind of hurdle. This town hall meeting was at the Kensington Wheaton area, and residents opened the forum addressing concerns regarding the upcoming Costco store in the Westfield Shopping Center. To require Costco and Westfield to develop this project in a way that benefits all of the community and does have those jobs, but not in a way that harms the neighborhood. Uh, at least in terms of the construction, it fits within at least as much as we possibly can to the community's needs. But as it relates to the gas station, uh, that will take a separate process, and whether they, they get that or not is a different question, but it would have to meet those requirements. And that's a pretty tough, tough standard to meet. The executive's recommended budget closes a $300 million gap for fiscal year 2012. Even though the budget focuses on protecting essential services and priorities of education, public safety, and the most vulnerable, it includes reductions in services and county staffing, and a reduction in local funding for the public school system. I'm wondering if you also consider our county schools a priority, especially in terms of maintaining its world-class um, status. I am a very strong believer in what you said about education and the value of it. And I will not do things that I think will be harmful for it. But we can make a periodic adjustment here and there. And when you look at the size of our budget, the investment that we're making, uh, I think that we can make this adjustment. The line of questioning focused mainly on budget cuts to the public libraries, the new code enforcement laws related to home-based businesses, education, and traffic. For County Report This Week, Lorna Virgili. Parking in Bethesda on Saturdays may no longer be free if a resolution before the council is passed. The measure is part of the county executive's fiscal year 12 operating budget, and it could raise more than $650,000. The fees will have to go through the public hearing process before the council can decide whether or not to approve the resolution. As Councilmember Roger Berliner tells us, folks in the Bethesda business community are split on this issue. Well, one, the Bethesda business community is very concerned about the county executive's proposal to increase parking in Bethesda, particularly Saturday parking, where we have not had Saturday parking fees. So in this economic climate, the business community, I met with them even yesterday, and they said, really need to explore options. This is a $700,000 item in a context of our county needing every penny we can get. So we will explore what options there are other than this, but this is certainly something that we're going to have to consider. Officials from the City of Rockville met with council members this week to brief them on their update to the Rockville Pike Neighborhood Plan. The plan focuses on transportation and land use issues along a two-mile stretch of the pike from Richard Montgomery Drive to Bow Avenue. Councilmember Nancy Florine briefed us on what they heard and how the city's plan fits in with the updated White Flint Master Plan. Our number one interest right now, of course, is how uh, Rockville Pike will ultimately design, be designed. Uh, will there be sufficient room to to carry what is has been uh, expected to be located there, which is some kind of uh, rapid transit bus service. And it, it raised a lot of the issues as to how local bus service will connect, uh, how regional bus service might uh, come through, and of course the ultimate connection to Metro, how this all is going to work. So uh, that conversation is uh, clearly beginning and is going to be pretty robust over the next year. Just over a year ago, the council passed legislation that requires restaurants with 20 or more chains nationwide to display calories on or next to menu boards. 
Full compliance with the regulation was required by January 1st of this year. Members of the Health and Human Services Committee have received an update on how restaurants are doing with implementing this law. As Councilmember George Leventhal tells us, there is still work that needs to be done. What uh, our health officer has said is that it's reasonable for a brand new requirement like this, that it might take as long as a year for restaurants to be fully compliant. And no restaurant has been cited. I believe that's okay, but beginning July 1, it will have been a year. And so the health department does need to enforce this law. It is the law in Montgomery County, and violations of the law could lead to suspension of a restaurant's license to operate. Still ahead on County Report this week, hands-on learning for some Montgomery County Public School students, and a new police headquarters for the city of Rockville is one step closer to reality. Stay with us. Welcome back to County Report. Montgomery County Police are investigating a robbery that took place last week in the eastern part of the county. Captain Paul Starks is here with the latest on this incident. Captain, what can you tell us? Well, Susan, on March 24th at about 6.30 p.m., two masked men armed with a handgun entered a convenience store at 11790 Cherry Hill Road in Silver Spring. According to witnesses, they forced patrons and employees to lie on the floor while they took an undisclosed amount of cash and merchandise from the store. We have some photos of them from the surveillance system, and you can see one of the suspects has dreadlocks past his shoulders, and another suspect is wearing thick black frame glasses. And if I understand correctly, this is a crime solvers case, so what should folks do if they have any information? Anyone with any information who wants to remain anonymous and be eligible for a reward can contact Crime Solvers of Montgomery County, provide that information, and detectives will contact them. Okay, thank you very much. Captain Paul Starks, Montgomery County Police. The Rockville Mayor and Council hosted a groundbreaking ceremony for the new Rockville City Police Department headquarters. The new headquarters is the site of the old post office building, which is located at 2 West Montgomery Avenue in the Rockville Town Center. The Rockville 11 crew was on hand to cover this event. The new Rockville City Police Department is one step closer to becoming a reality. The new police headquarters will be taking over the old post office after the federal government donated the building to the city. Congressman Chris Van Hollen was on hand to help break ground at the historic site. All of you who have been a part of this effort uh, know that it has been uh, not an easy task. Uh, whenever you're dealing with federal surplus property, uh, you know what a tough uh, challenge it can be. Uh, but we persevered together. And most of all, I want to thank uh, the folks in the Rockville City Police uh, Force uh, for what you do every day uh, for our community. So we salute you. We're grateful uh, to you for your service and again congrats to the uh, council and the mayor and everybody who had a part in this it's great to be here today well, thanks to this, the community our mayor and council to everyone uh, particularly the men and women have worked so hard and have worked in a very uh, uh, confined space for many many years to get a, a state-of-the-art police department is just going to make a, a world of difference it's going to be one-stop shopping for us bringing all of our, our units back together here and we think it's going to be good for the city thank you Starting April 10th, Ride on Bus passengers in Montgomery County can help needy families and receive free bus rides by donating canned or non-perishable food. Ride on's annual food drive runs from Sunday, April 10th through Saturday, April 16th. A free trip will be provided to riders who donate food during that time. Food collected from the drive goes to the Mana Food Center, which feeds 3,000 hungry families a month. Recently, Montgomery County Public Schools signed an agreement with the U.S. Navy to provide training for teachers while also providing unique learning opportunities for students. Using materials supplied by the Navy, students worked in teams to build a remote-controlled vehicle called a sea perch. Let's take a look at this fascinating example of how students develop their skills through hands-on learning. Recently, Montgomery County Public Schools signed an agreement for a long-term partnership in support of our STEM vision. 
and the technological edge of the United States Navy rests on a foundation of solid science and technological innovation. So it, we really welcome the opportunity to further um, careers and interest in those fields. Students are presented with a design challenge. We need to, to build this underwater uh, remotely operated vehicle to gather oil globs. It's great that you know the Navy provides this for us, it, and it connects to what's going on in the world. I mean, they just saw ROVs with the oil plumes, you know, with the oil cleanup, and now they're getting to build them. Engineers from the Navy volunteer to work with our students and teach our teachers a few tricks about the build. The hands-on component is very key to student learning. They have to troubleshoot. Things are not going to work first time around, and that's really important in the learning cycle. The final activity that we did, uh, we went to Carter Rock to test out the sea perch. Yeah, let's not get any of the electronic parts into water. Each group of students had an engineer as their lead person that was making them test and, and grading them on how well their sea perch held up in the tanks. It really is important to engage the students instead of telling them about it because those stereotypes about engineers or mathematicians or scientists will persist unless we do a really good job of engaging them in that real life activity in our classroom. So you can have this for the bottom and that one for the top. We can't wait until our students get to high school or college to say, hey, wouldn't this be something interesting to do? So by targeting middle school students and providing role models, it really helps our students see themselves in these positions later on in their lives. Way to go. You're on your way to being awesome engineers. Next school year, MCPS hopes to partner with the Navy once again and debut additional lessons designed for elementary and high school students. Still to come on County Report this week, Montgomery College is awarded a grant for a new student exchange program. And a look at a Smithsonian exhibit currently underway in downtown Silver Spring. We'll be right back. Welcome back to County Report. Recently, a delegation of Montgomery College officials traveled to India to lead the two-day national symposium on 21st century community colleges in New Delhi. Program participants came from higher education, industry, government, and nonprofit organizations throughout India to discuss community colleges in America and India. The Bureau of South and Central Asian Affairs at the U.S. Department of State awarded Montgomery College a grant with support from the U.S. India Education Foundation. In addition to the symposium, the grant will assist Montgomery College in its efforts to develop a faculty and student exchange program with three higher education institutions in India later this year and to create a faculty development program. Montgomery College President Diran Pollard reflects on the trip. Having the opportunity to actually experience India, Indian people, its culture, its traditions, uh, was truly a, a life changer for me. This is a country that is growing rapidly, that's developing at a pace in which will clearly outpace uh, much of the world in the next several years. But it's a country that's grappling with several things. Uh, poverty is significant there. Uh, only approximately 12 percent of the Indian population has a form of higher education. So as a result of that, uh, what I love and, and just makes me giddy inside is the fact that India is recognizing the value and worth of the American community college system. It sees it as a, an agent of change, uh, a true mobility moment for the country. So the opportunity to go there and talk about what we do, how we were founded, to give examples of how we tightly couple ourselves with business and industry, to talk about the way in which we deliver our services and programs, and then to serve in a lot of ways in a consultancy role with folks who are in the midst of developing a community college system was truly a professional high for me as well. So for me, I think both of those things would be things I will never forget about that experience. A Smithsonian Institution exhibit, Between Fences, is currently on display at the Silver Spring Civic Center. The display looks at the national importance of fences, barriers, and borders in American history. The Montgomery County Historical Society has created a companion exhibit, Good Neighbors Fences in Montgomery County, and our photographer Mike Springer took a tour of both of these showcases. My name is Joanna Church. I'm the Director of Collections for the Montgomery County Historical Society. The exhibit uh, Between Fences came about 
It is an exhibit, a traveling exhibit created by the Smithsonian Institution Traveling Exhibit Services. So Between Fences has been touring Maryland. We're its fourth um, venue in Maryland. We got to do it, we're very excited. Between Fences is basically about literally fences. Um, and a lot of people are like, oh. Um, but um, once you explain to people, it's really a bit about land use, it's about um, the actual physical fence, what is the fence for, what is it holding in, what is it keeping out, how does that create um, tension between neighbors, sometimes it, it helps uh, resolve tension between neighbors. These two gentlemen are, are leaning over their, their nice wooden fence. It's sort of a, a typical scene that we think of um, for old-fashioned America where you, you, you talk to your neighbors and you can go borrow a cup of sugar over the fence. and um, A lot of people feel we've gotten away from that now. Um, a six-foot plastic privacy fence doesn't really invite talking over the fence to your neighbors. There's all different kinds of fences, including barbed wire for cattle all kinds of just different fences for different purposes and I tried to show as many of them as I could. You can have a decorative fence a fun versus a functional fence. You might want to put a nice decorative hedge just to, do, to mark out your front yard but that isn't necessarily going to keep the cows from from rampaging all over your front yard. So the white picket fence is um, some people take it literally when they get their house they want that white picket fence um, but for most people it, it symbolizes ownership of of land um, which particularly since World War II has become very um, important in American culture. Montgomery County Historical Society created a companion exhibit, which um, every venue is supposed to create a companion exhibit. Good fences make good neighbors. And we take that same story and we apply it to the Montgomery County story. I didn't want to just have pictures in this exhibit. I wanted to make sure there was other evidence, um, whether it's archival or artifacts. Um, so I found this, um, this is a page from a farm journal from the Woodlands Farm in Clopper, which is basically Gaithersburg now. And this page for January 1880, there's a lot of references to Mr. Plummer working on and repairing fences. So I thought it just really proves, yes, there were fences and people had to make them and they were a lot of work. It was taken in the 1890s, but the house is very typical of, of 17, late 18th century houses in Montgomery County. Very clear picket fence in front of it. I really like pictures of people standing in front of their houses. <laughs> when you're proud of your house, you're proud of your family, you're gonna stand in front of your house and be like, this is me, my house, here I am, I, this is who I am. And I love those photographs. Now here's Tom Pogue with this week's transportation update. Hi, I'm Tom Pogue, Community Relations Manager for the Department of Transportation. Here's an update for Montgomery County. Following County Executive Leggett's formation of a Rapid Transit Task Force, MCDOT recently briefed members and interested residents on the results of a feasibility study that looked at constructing bus rapid transit lines throughout the county. The study recommended developing bus rapid transit along 16 corridors, totaling 150 miles. Such a system would feature streamlined vehicles with service similar to light rail but at lower cost. Passengers would pay their fares in advance and enter low floor buses directly through multiple doors, no steps or lifts. Buses would arrive at stations every 10 minutes or less, preferably operating on the median of major roads such as Veers Mill, Georgia Avenue and Randolph Road. When operating on general use lanes, the buses could be given priority at traffic signals, meaning buses can hold the green light a little longer while clearing the intersection. Soon, you can learn more about bus rapid transit plans on our website at montgomerycountymd.gov mcdot. We're working to keep you moving quickly. Up next on County Report, open up your heart and your home to our pet of the week. And we find out about a special event hosted by Brookside Gardens. Keep it here on County Report This Week. The Impact Awards were established in 2008 to honor the unsung heroes in our communities who are contributing to the vision of making Silver Spring a thriving multicultural community. This year's awardees were selected by an awards committee made up of diverse business and community leaders, as well as former award winners. Our friends at Montgomery Community Media were there and they bring us this report. During these tough economic times, it is essential more now than ever that we acknowledge our pioneers, explorers, and leaders making a difference in our community. Each year, 
Impact Silver Spring, a nonprofit organization devoted to creating and sustaining a diverse and thriving multicultural community, honors unsung heroes who have ignited the power of Silver Spring through their work. The real challenge is how do we effectively manage change in Montgomery County? And for some, it's a welcome change. Uh, for others, it's a fear. But whether you fear it or whether you welcome it, we are changing as a community. We named the awards to represent three different types of people. People who did not feel much power in the community but stepped out to assume power. Um, people who already had positional power but were trying to share that power. And then groups of people who came together across differences to build a collaborative effort together. We know that there's lots of reasons why some students don't do well. We, we want to address the issues of race and ethnicity so that we really understand how to work with all different cultures. Our organization, almost the only one that is serving the Africans, and particularly the youth, when they come in this country, they are really lost. Kim Smith, the winner of the Pioneer Award, is a pedestrian advocate and has been working for a safe and equal pedestrian access to county streets for 15 years. When you tell people that the sidewalks need, need help or that it's important for people to get out into the neighborhood and, and walk, it, it's almost a foreign concept to people now. And uh, so that's probably been the largest, the, the biggest challenge that I've had to overcome is, is, to, is making people understand that, uh, what the situation is outside of a car in this neighborhood. In our Pet of the Week segment, Kathy Stanhope introduces us to a female cat named Lee who is looking for a new home. Hi, this is Kathy Stanhope with your Pet of the Week at the Montgomery County Humane Society and I'm sitting here with Lee who is a very nice, very sweet cat. She's about a year and a half old. She's incredibly soft and she's been sitting in a cage for a while so she's a little startled at being taken out of the cage but she's very friendly usually, she's very nice, she's very affectionate and she loves to play games. She's still got a lot of kitten in her. She's only, like I said, about a year and a half old. She loves playing with toys. She loves playing chase. She loves chasing anything that's held on a string in front of her. So come down to the Humane Society and meet Lee or another cat like her. And also consider being a foster caretaker for kittens. Kitten season is starting and the Humane Society is just inundated with kittens come April and May and June and they really need help. They need people to come and take the litters of kittens and take care of them. That way you won't have to adopt an animal and you have a lot of your expenses taken care of, but you can, really can help an animal and help a whole bunch of animals when you can take a litter of kitten in, kittens in as a foster caregiver. So give us a call at 240-773-5967 or visit us on the web at mchumane.org or even come on down and visit us in Rockville and meet Lee or another kitten just like her, and you might go home with your new very best friend. In this week's Brookside Gardens Clips and Tips, Mark Richardson tells us about an upcoming writer workshop featuring famous gardener Rosalind Creasy. Hi, I'm Mark Richardson. I'm the Adult Programs Manager here at Brookside Gardens in Wheaton, Maryland. This year, we're very excited to welcome Rosalind Creasy, the First Lady of Edible Landscaping, to the gardens on April 28th and April 29th for two great events. Uh, in the evening on April 28th, Rosalind will be doing a talk. She just recently released a new version of her first book, uh, The Complete Guide to Edible Landscaping, and she'll be giving a talk about that book uh, and about all of her um, great tips for for growing an edible garden uh, throughout your landscape and really making it an exceptional ornamental garden as well. Um, Rosalind will join us again on April 29th uh, for a talk about gardening with children. She's a, a grandmother and just has a, a great attitude toward gardening with kids and getting kids excited about um, gardening with their, with their families. And so she's a great speaker. We're really looking forward to welcoming her. For more information about Rosalind and her books and uh, her appearances here at Brookside Gardens, look to our website website brooksidegardens.org and we'd love to see you there so please uh, mark your calendar April 28th 7 to 9 p.m. for the evening lecture and April 29th from 10 to 11 30 uh, for the morning lecture on gardening with kids. Well that does it for County Report this week. Tune in again next week for a look at what's going on inside Montgomery County. I'm Susan Kennedy. Thanks for watching.
there's still time to get your tickets for MC's annual alumni awards. On Friday, April 15th, four former students will receive the Milton F. Clogg Outstanding Alumni Award, and four more will enter the Athletic Hall of Fame. Channel 5 Sue Palka will MC the event. The Globe Water Tower that sits on MC's Germantown campus will be repainted with the same worldly design. WSSC has awarded a contract to have the iconic 2 million gallon water storage tank repainted and work begins soon. MC's cricket team finished second in the nation, losing a tight match in the finals to local rival George Mason at the American College Cricket Championships held in Fort Lauderdale, Florida. MC won the national championship in 2009. For more information about the endless possibilities at your community college, visit our website.